celebrating our 33rd year at the Cannes Film Festival. We are delighted to present in partnership with the Golden Globe Awards, Celine DeVoe, director, Everybody Loves Jean, Eleanor Gurry, screenwriter, The Worst Ones, Emily Leteff, director, More Than Ever, Miriam Tuzani, director, The Blue Captain, and moderated by Helen Hanna, president of the HFPA. So please silence your phones and join me in welcoming Celine, Eleanor, Emily, Miriam, and Helen to the stage. Hello, everyone. Uh, so great to see you all. Thank you for joining us here today. I'm so pleased um, to be moderating this panel, especially this panel, because this is a panel about uh, empowering women behind the lens. And I think an, a hugely important topic, because there's still not enough women behind the lens, as we know. And so I think it's just wonderful to see you all. And thank you for joining us here today. Um, it's really great to see you. Let me do a quick introduction. Um, I start with Céline. Céline Deveau is a French director and illustrator whose first feature film, Everybody Loves John, is part of the Critics Week section here in Cannes this year. Um, prior to this, Céline has won multiple awards for her animated shorts, including Gros Chagrin, is that how you pronounce it? Good. And Le Repas Dominical. Yeah. Perfect. And then, um, more than ever, is the name of the feature film um, from Emily Atef. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as a French Iranian director who was born in Berlin, Emily studied filmmaking at the German Film Academy in Berlin and has won several awards for her earlier work. This includes seven Lolas. Congratulations um, for the for the feature film Three Days in Quiberon in 2018, including Best Film and Best Director. Fantastic. And then Eleanor Gurry <laughs> is a French filmmaker, screenwriter, and actor with a string of film and television screenwriting credits to her name. She is also the co-screenwriter of Le Pire, <laughs> which is part of Un Certain Regard um, here in Cannes this year. And Le Pire is directed by young French fil filmmakers Lise Akoka and Romain Gure. And then last but not least, Mariam Tuzani is a filmmaker from Morocco whose movie The Blue Caftan is part of A Certain Regard here in Cannes. Um, over the years, Mariam projects have won numerous accolades um, and awards. In 2019, her directorial feature film debut was a movie named Adam, which was selected as the Moroccan entry for Best International Feature Film at the 92nd Academy Awards. Adam was also part of Certain Regard here in Cannes. Welcome back, Mariam. And thank you so much, all of you, for joining us. Thank you. Um, I want to start this panel by asking you, um, as women directors and writers, what have been your greatest challenges in getting your films done and premiered here in Cannes? I had the idea of um, more than ever in 2010. Oh. It's been 12 years for it to come out for different reasons. Also, I guess I needed the I did films in between. It's it's my fifth feature, but I needed the maturity um, also uh, to make uh, this existential piece. Uh, but also, it was uh, it was also very hard to finance because it talks about a subject that we that we will all live. It talks about the end of uh, of life, and that is something that I guess is seen as dark. Though I shot it in a place where darkness does not exist in Norway in the summer, and it's also a film full of optimism. But I guess the biggest challenge was um, there's two challenges. One is my main character, played by Vicky Creeps, oh, yeah. is um, She's the one that's sick and she takes decisions that society and her loving husband and mother do not understand. And in the process of uh, financing it, I very often had to hear, well, she's not very sympathetic. Where I was like, ah, because when you're dying, you have to be sympathetic. But the thing is, is that very often, I mean, in my experience, it's that almost all my films are about 
women in existential crises. The first one I had in Cannes was about postnatal depression, and it was also a woman that was not very sympathetic. And it's, that's the thing. I had the feeling that women need to be sympathetic often for funders. I mean, in Germany for sure. And, that, and I just cannot stand it. Uh, that um, we, um, that it is still challenging to have women with dark thoughts who take wrong decisions and who are not sympathetic. And here, Hélène, well, she's dying and she does what she needs to do. Mm -hmm. She finds the place she needs to go to. So I find that an emancipation is wonderful. So that was, I guess, one of the challenges. And also another challenge is just to get after five films, and like you said, I thought that after the success of Three Days in Quiberon, it would be easier and the budgets would be higher. Well, it wasn't. And that's, and that's annoying when I'm thinking, how long does it have to be that I always have to have budgets, you know, that are tough where I have to always, you know, uh, shoot in so, so many, you know, days and stuff. So yeah, those are the challenges. But, what doesn't break me makes me stronger. Mm. So there we go. You would think that after three days in Quiberon, it would have been much easier we for you, right? We thought that with my producer, but it wasn't the case because my subjects, again, oh, who, you know, that's, yeah. a, it's just, there's like, after five years yeah, and films have been in big festivals, and you'd think that maybe people trust that even if you have a hard subject, it won't be, because I never do depressing films. I do hard films, but they always finish with light. Mm -hmm. But it's not, it's always, again, uh, you know, fight. I, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. So. Great, thank you for sharing. And Céline? I think the, that when I started working on the movie uh, Everybody Loves Jen, I didn't really reflect on the idea of being a woman writing or something. It's, it's just so obvious that I didn't think of it. And at one point, I realized that I was, uh, I, I had a mission or something. Like, I admired so many works from men were growing up with such freedom to do whatever they wanted and tell whatever they wanted to be funny or vulgar or violent. And suddenly at one point I was like, oh my God, I'm so polite. <laughs> I'm being so presentable. And that was a really good feeling that I didn't give a shit anymore. You know? And suddenly the writing was different and the directing was different. And uh, for instance, I decided something that I didn't think of, that I made the voiceover of my film. And it was an accident. It wasn't supposed to be. When I, ch I decided to do it, I was like, oh, am, I, am I allowed? Am I, do I have the skills for that? Maybe I, sh I should probably call an actor to, or an actress to do that. And then I thought of a lot of men directors that had done it and didn't, you know, didn't care. It was funny. It was sincere. And I felt good about that. That's it. <laughs> That just teaches us that we, you know, we, we just have to do it, right? Yeah. yeah. Marianne? I generally don't think before I write. I generally don't think before... I, I mean, when I, when I write a film, it never comes from, from something uh, that I intellectualize. So I never really asked myself whether it would be more difficult for me or less difficult for me. All I knew is that there was a, a story I wanted to tell, talking about my first short film already. You know, there was something I needed to share. Uh, an experience I needed to write about, and I wanted to 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 have the images on this on the, on this on this um, on these feelings, and uh, and so I never really asked myself the question whether it would be harder for me or not as a woman. And I think that maybe it's because I didn't sit and think about this that at the end of the day I didn't feel that I had any particular difficulty in shooting my films because I was a woman. And it's true that I make films in Morocco about subjects that aren't always, always easy. For example, I mean, Adam, uh, my first feature film is a film about um, uh, an unwed mother. And an unwed mother is something that, I mean, it's the worst thing that can happen to a woman, literally, almost, mm -hmm. uh, because it's, um, it's, a, it's a very hard situation in Morocco. I mean, of course, I mean, in that sense. And I knew that this would be a subject that was hard to tackle, but I mean, I. Once again, I didn't think about the difficulties before, do, before trying to, to, to finance this film. I didn't think about the difficulties when I was writing it either. I don't know, I just, there's function very much on, on instinct and on, on urge and on desire. Maybe it's got its good points or not, but you know, I just, it's, I don't know how to do things uh, in another manner. Okay, thank you. Eleonore? My fights are more uh, to have time to write because we wrote for like three years. 
So when you write for three years and it's a first movie and it's very risky because it's a movie about a movie and you have like no casting, no stars, and you're nobody, you need time. It's like cooking. I love things that are very well cooked, you know? So that's a big fight in the industry in general, you know? It's not about just women. It's just, can we have time to write? Thank you, <laughs> because it's better then. For this movie especially, because we uh, actually got the inspiration of all the characters from real people that we cast through years. We've been like casting maybe 250 teenagers. And the, the second struggle is when you have a screenplay then and you try to put a lot of complexity in it. And so the characters are subtle or hard to understand sometimes and they just like resemble life, you know. Uh, you have many commissions to pass through to finance and they, you have to fight for your characters to stay complex all the time because people just want you to make choices. It's like, but is he an asshole or he's not? And you're like, no, it's a person. I'm sorry. <laughs> so nothing to do with women for me. I mean, in that movie. Can you tell us what you consider to be one of the big break or opportunities that you had pre that presented itself for you to take that step forward professionally? I'm sorry, I never felt that way. Mm -hmm. I no, I always I've always been discreet and in my head, and I've always believed in what was making me dreaming, and I was never career oriented or ambition oriented. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy to be here. I mean, really, really, because I think we work very hard to make this vision or, and this, you know, what we had in the heart and in the mind, we just fought a lot. And so I'm very happy people can enjoy that. But there was no, like, big moment. I was like, wow, this is happening. I'm going, no. Yeah. Marianne, did you have that? You mean a turning point? Yes, like, like an opportunity that presented itself where you thought, okay, this is... An opportunity? I don't know if I'd call it an opportunity, but what? I mean, f for me, there was a turning point where I decided, yes, I want to make films. And that was, because um, I, I was a journalist before. And my, my, my interest in film, in, in journalism, came always from my interest in, in, in tout ce qui, I don't know how you say it in English, l'humain, uh, human beings, mm -hmm. and the complexity and everything that we experience inside. And I always like to listen to people, to, to listen to people's stories. And that's what, what's always moved me and what's always been my motivation. So I moved from, uh, from, uh, making, from writing as a journalist uh, to, to documentary filmmaking. And then there was a moment in my life, which was the loss of my father. And that was something that I experienced. I mean, for me, it was, uh, it was really the, the, you know, the real turning point, because that's the moment when I realized that there were so many things I felt that I needed to, to give a voice to, uh, because it also said a lot about the society I lived in, about uh, certain traditions, things that I had experienced in a quite violent manner. But then again, like, um, like you were saying before, there's something very beautiful as well that can come out of these dark things. And for me, you know, in all the darkness, obviously, there's something that's very, very powerful. And there is these moments you know, when you realize why, you know, why, why you're doing things and you ask yourself the right questions. And for me, that was really the, the, the turning point. So that's where I wrote my first short film, which is about a little eight-year-old girl accompanying, accompanying her grandfather to, through death, his, his dead body, and saying goodbye to him the way she feels. She wants to say goodbye, and not the way that her society is imposing it on her. And uh, because she is a child, she's free. She has the strength to, to do that, because she doesn't know what it is to be socially correct uh, yet. And so that was my, fir my first experience, and that's really what made me want uh, to, to, to express myself in this manner. And then it took me five years to write another film because I didn't, I didn't feel I wanted to make films just to make films. I, feel, I felt that there was some, that I had to, to answer to something that I felt very, um, very strongly inside. So that was, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Celine, did you have an opportunity, a, a certain moment that presented itself for you to break through? No, it wasn't an opportunity either, but uh, I, I remember that uh, when I graduated, I decided that I would have a really shitty day job and I could write. Because, you know, you graduate and then you run, you run into people from your university and they're, they're like working with 
people, they're professional, you know, they, it looks good, it sounds good. And I was basically copying and pasting stuff for a communication agency. And I, what I did had absolutely no sense. But I, I had three days of, of work that paid for the rest and I could write my movie. And that was the moment I chose. Because, yeah, it was embarrassing. <laughs> so, you know, being embarrassed because you need to write, is, it's a good, uh, how do you say that, like an engine, yeah. An engine, yeah. yeah. I started as a young woman thinking that I wanted to be a theater actress. So I, I went to drama school in France and then I, I got a job in London and I worked there and I was never either in drama school or then in the work in the theater totally myself, one, which one maybe isn't at the age of 20. It's, I mean, 20s were not so cool, I found, but I preferred my 30s, 40s. Uh, but, um, and then there was, um, uh, and then I, I started to write little stories for myself and I bought a DV camera. Uh, this was like end of the 90s and started to make little films with my colleagues from the theater and they were quite bad because I had no idea how to do that. But, and I did, I, we do it in like my country house in, in east of France, brought them over from London. And it was like the first time, and I think I was 27. So it was late, yeah, to find out. And it was the first time I felt I was standing like a trunk. Like it was the most amazing feeling of, I know what I want and I, the identity just emerged. This is what I want. And then it went really quick because in London it's very hard to make films if you don't, you know, if you don't come from a film school, but film school is very expensive. And I went back to Berlin where it's a national school like in France and it's free. And it was hard to get in there and you had to make a film and do loads of things. But then they took 12 people a year and I actually arrived, I was 30, and I had some people in my class, they were like 21. And I was just, because I, you know, suffered, done, tried to find, mm -hmm. tried to do, I just finished, like, whew, came out of there with two features, which one of them was a Nasser Man. And that was then, that was so my motor of, yeah. And it's been pleasure except, and that's, I always like to, talk about that because people, you know, and also sometimes I teach and, you know, they, and often students, you know, they just want to hear your, your success stories because it inspires. But I, what I also like to tell them is after my third film, which was not a success for four and a half years, and I just had a child and I, we just had bought like an attic and we were building it. And for four and a half years, I got no job at all. It was like the blockade of the universe, though I had so many ideas. I just, you know, because I did film, it was just, I, I would have done anything, like TV, but my German agent was saying, when I did my first films, I remember in festivals, people would ask, so how is it, you know, with women and, and men? And I was just like, what are you talking about? I'm just a filmmaker. <laughs> because in film school, it's very 50-50. I mean, I mean, for sure, I think it's the same maybe in, in France. I don't, oh, you didn't go to film school, probably. You learn it, but, but in, in Germany, it is also like that. It's parité, it's like, there was 12 directors, six were men, six were women. So starting there, and funny enough, and they also proved it through statistic, that women in film school get more prizes in festivals than, than male, I mean, in Germany. And so when I did my first, I didn't know what they were going on about, talking about women, you know, being, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm a woman, I make films. It's just after that third film, where one of them was in Cannes, and I won so many prizes with also the others, that I realized, four and a half years, I realized, fuck, it really is, because my agent was saying, I can't, it's just not happening. They're not interested. But the young guys coming out of school, they're sexy. Though they didn't go to Canada. And she's, she, go, she got all the jobs for them. And she was, and that's when I started to, yeah, uh, to be proactive and 
political, actually. In Germany, this thing called pro quota, it's like 50-50 in France. But it's funny because, uh, and it's really not to criticize, but often when I meet young filmmakers, women, they're like, you know, and I, you know, sometimes I talk to them about, they're like, what are you on about? Where, you know, that's not my life. And I'm thinking, but I do think that it's easier. It's good, it's easier for us now. And it's gonna be easier for young filmmakers. It is because, because, we're, because we're fighting. But it, it I, I mean, for my life for sure, I saw a difference and I'm seeing a different, um, I'm seeing also different politics now and I'm seeing we're allowed to do more. And I'm seeing that now because it's politically correct to have a woman, it's all hypocrisy. They don't even want it, but now you need to have, be a woman of color, we're very lucky now. We're women of color and we're women, yeah? But at the end of the day, it's a, you know, it's hypocrisy. It's just because now it's kind of a fashion, but we have to go on that, on that wave, I find, ride it till we don't have to talk about it anymore because we're half on this planet. I'm gonna stop after this, yeah? <laughs> it's just because I just have to say that on this planet, half of humanity yeah. is male and half is female, it's as simple as that. Yes. And there are wonderful male stories mm -hmm. and there are wonderful female stories. Mm -hmm. And we have just not told enough female stories. When I was growing up as a child, I was always looking for that girl, yeah? Mm -hmm. And I looked like Mowgli from the Jungle yeah. Book. And that, I also wanted to ride and be with the animals and, and not be at the end, the last five minutes, the pretty girl. Yeah. You know, we had so little role models. Yeah. And as a young woman as well, and now it's starting. It really is starting. Mm -hmm. And I think even in Cannes, a lot of, there's a lot of female um, content even made from men. Mm -hmm. So it's never against men. It's just about um, reflecting the world. 50-50, 50-50 mm -hmm. stories. 50-50, I pay my taxes. I think it's 50-50 funding. Mm -hmm. why, why? Why not? Yeah. And that's it. OK. Yeah. <laughs> No, thank you. I also look forward to the day where we don't have to even talk about um, empowering women behind the lens anymore. Well, we'll just be normal. Like, we don't even have to discuss whether it's male or female. Um, but, you know, we all know how difficult it is to, to make movies, to get movies made. And, you know, and I'm always astonished when I hear it takes, you know, years for, for movies to make made. What do you consider the biggest obstacle still remaining for women to get directing nods and their green lights for their screenplays. I might not be a good person because I'm a screenwriter. <laughs> so yes. maybe like getting to direct, maybe I should leave. No, but as a screenwriter too, I mean, to as green a screenwriter, light it's, a I mean, what you said is so true. I mean, like um, we're, we're in a kind of revolution for we're mm -hmm. still doing this revolution. And so you have excesses and you have like hypocrisy. So like all the producers now, they want to do some feminist shit, sorry. And they like are exploiting women in their own production company or they're having like machistic behavior or they're like very, this happens all the time. I mean, all the time, it's not even like, so, but it's sometimes it's the same with like political values. Like many films are like driven with like very beautiful political values and it's, it's very humanistic. And then you just see how people act and it's like <laughs> very funny. So, I mean, I just see that as, but like the, the fight, yeah, it's, I mean, it has to be still, look at us. Like, I mean, we need to put some hills. It's been three days I put hills, my, my foot are like a wreck. I have bandage everywhere, you know, and now I'm, and I'm just, I'm, sometimes I'm, I talk to my mother and she's like a high journalist. She has like 30 years of career and she tells me, I don't even get how you have to put heels. Whereas when I was in the 60s or 70s, this would never happen that we let this happen. I mean, like the, the, the feminist people at that time. So some things are progressing and some things are going backwards. It's very complex. That's my point of view. Mariam, what do you think? The biggest obstacle still, especially from your world. I'm sure you're, you're, you're a fighter, right? I, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what I, what I, I, I'll stick to what I said before because that's what I you know, deeply believe in, that for me what matters is to you know, say 
um, talk about things that, that make uh, sense to me, that move me, that haunt me. A lot of these subjects are related uh, to, I mean, for example, in my previous film, Adam, it is a film about two women and a little girl. And, you know, it has been qualified as a women's film, but for me, it's not a women's film. Mm. For me, it's a film about, um, about, about human beings, about human emotions. And what moved me to writing that film was uh, my maternity and what my experience of being a mother. That's how I started writing this script, because I had, been, I had met this young unwed mother that my parents had taken in, and she had completely, you know, uh, you know, bouleversé, I don't know how you say that in English, uh, um, she, yeah, she really, really moved me a lot of years before. So becoming a mother, I realized a lot of things, and I just started writing once again without intellectualizing things. So yes, I made this film that talks about her struggle as a woman in a society where it's very hard for her to exist uh, as a single mother and another woman's trying to cope with death at the same time. But I didn't write these stories only because these characters were women. I just wrote them because they touched me at that moment as a human being. Uh, my film that is here in Cannes uh, has three characters, three main characters. Two are men and one is a woman. Once again, for me, it's about humanity. It's a hum human. It's about the stories you choose to tell. And, uh, and that's what I think is the most important thing. And that's also about, I mean, of course, there are things that might be more, more difficult, more challenging sometimes. But for me, it's really about reaching into what all these things inside us that, that, that bring us together as well. And it might sound a little bit naive. I don't know if it does, but it doesn't matter for me. I mean, because what I want to say is that I don't have the feeling that I have to be fighting all the time mm -hmm. because the fight is there in any case. I mean, the choices you make, the stories you choose to tell, uh, whole, carry, carry a struggle in them anyhow. Uh, and for me, whether as a woman, I don't feel that I should not be able to uh, talk about uh, uh, a, a male character. Or, you know what I mean? I don't feel, mm -hmm. I don't want to be limited. And I feel sometimes that there's this kind of a limitations. It's like if I, um, uh, I, I had to be put in a box. It's like after Adam, uh, a lot of times I was told, so are you going to continue making women's films? And I want to say, I don't want to continue making women's films or not women's films. I just want to make films that touch me about um, characters that touch me, uh, whether they be masculine or whether they be feminine. That's not that's not what is at the heart of what I want to say. I don't even want to have to ask myself those questions. So, uh, so yeah, I, I don't know if that makes sense, but. Yeah, thank you so much. Celine, the, uh, the obstacles that you have, that you think women are still facing in today's. I, I, I don't know because we are, we are having this conversation in you know, 2022. Mm -hmm. A lot of things have happened. A lot of, I mean, the idea that Feminine representation wasn't, you know, enough, is now quite crystal clear in a lot of industries. And I come from, a, uh, you know, in France, the, the cinema industry is very public. It's very, I'm very privileged. I can make movies. Mm -hmm. It's, frankly, I will not say it's difficult for me. It would be totally dishonest. But there is something weird is that you, you make, you work, you write, blah, 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 you finish your movie, and then suddenly someone is like, oh, you're a woman, it's a woman's movie, it's about women, right? And it was all like written with your vagina or something. <laughs> so of course it's reductive, of course it's hard to hear that, yes. because as you said, you talk about emotions or what mm. you care about. And I think the only thing is that the more all these political structures work, the more women are effectively put in power positions, represented, just like there's a little girl, she looks, I don't know, she watches TV, someone is powerful, it's a woman. That's the only, only thing you need to grow up. And when you are an adult, you're like, I can do that. I saw it on TV. That's the only thing. Because mm -hmm. afterwards, having to talk, you know, it's weird. It's not an artistic question, but it is because it's structural. Like, um, I'm not very clear, but you know. yeah. And Emily, you already discussed the four-year break where you couldn't get anything done. But what do you think are the obstacles that, that most women still face, especially in directing nods and, and getting their screenplays greenlit? I mean, now, funny enough, I'm getting a totally an obstacle again for, mm. for my next movie, which is totally uh, versed around. Uh, it's like, 
the Me Too movement, which is, I find, one of the best things that could happen for any kind of line of work of uh, people of power, have they be male or female, uh, using their power and putting down somebody sexually or not sexually, just putting them down, which happens often also in film, through shouting and making people feel like shit and bullying them. Mm. But of course, then there's, it becomes then such a fashion that it then it takes something on that becomes totally unhealthy. And my next film, and I, because I'm the same, when I read it, the next film I'm doing, and I'm actually starting in two and a half weeks to shoot. Oh. It's my first novel adaptation. Mm -hmm. And again, it's a long process. I read the novel in 2011. It's a, a German novel called One Day We'll Tell Each Other Everything, written by an mm -hmm. amazing um, novelist from East Germany. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, I, and it's very minimalistic. When I read it, I just, I saw a film. Mm -hmm. And um, it took that time to, to get the rights and she's adapting it with me. And it's about an amour fou story Mm -hmm. Very, a, a very crazy love story, very sexual love story mm -hmm. between a 17, 18 year old girl and a 40 year old man. Oh. Oops, <laughs> exactly. Oops, all of a sudden it's oops, yeah? Oops. Uh, 10 years ago it would have been yeah. fine. Yeah. Uh, in, um, during the first summer after the wall came down, mm. In, East, in the countryside in Eastern Germany, mm. where everything's very slow and stuff. And then, again, with my producer, Carsten Stötter, from Three Days in Kibron, we thought in Germany, we said, finally, this is gonna be so easy. We won all these awards in Germany. We had people in the cinema for a black and white film, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, that was the time people were still in 2018 going to the cinema. The novelist since then has become a bestseller novelist. This is gonna be boom. Well, no, again, not. Because of the subject. Because in the funding juries, some you know, men or women were like, oh yeah, well, I get an amazing story, da, da, da. I adapted it with her. Mm -hmm. And half of it, which you're often where women actually says, well, we can't tell that story. I mean, I, we can't tell that story. How could she even, I mean, these were the critiques we we're getting. Mm. How could she even fall in love with this guy who's quite dark? It's like, guy, mm. she lives with her boyfriend on the farm of her parents. And on the other side of the hill, there is a, there's this other farm. And it's this guy, quite attractive, quite dark, who takes care of horses. And they start this mad affair. Mm. And how could she even fall in love with somebody like that? Where you're like, oh, because you always fall in love with somebody that's perfect. Oh, so you don't know anybody who's taking the wrong decision? And I just realized that, we just realized we're, it's so hard to finance because it's always 50-50, because it's like politically incorrect to tell a story about a sexual desire of a 17-year-old for a 40-year-old. And I got so upset yeah. that once in a Zoom call for like this big funder, <laughs> And my producer was going, oh no, I just started ranting like now. But, but, but this is a film written by female, adapted by two females, about, directed by a woman about the sexual desires of a 17-year-old girl. And you're, not, and you're telling us we're not allowed to do it because of Me Too? Yeah. Are you guys crazy? I mean, Me Too, it, it is for Me Too. It's like we are allowed to tell any stories about any women and about any men because men have been telling stories forever and we've liked them, Fellini, Sorrentino, about young guys looking at the ant, the, all the, you know, the mature woman wanting to touch the vagina but so afraid of that thing. And, and it's fantastic because yeah. this is what happens to young guys and this is what happens, guess what? It also happens to young women sometimes, afraid of the penis, but <laughs> thinking I want to touch it. It's something dark, but trying to go there, pushing oneself, even if the guy's not, you know, it's, yeah. and why are we not allowed to tell this story? Yeah. And then I, the guy of the funding saying, well, Miss Atif, <laughs> uh, why don't you just write that down and give it, and give it in with the funding? 
That moment I did that, and we got all the funding from all the funding things. Yeah, because what could they say? They can't, you know, if they say, we can't give that today, today we can't. We just can't allow those kinds of films because of, and then what could you do? You can't allow a film made about female desire? What the hell? Oh, thank you for sharing those. <laughs> it's just so annoying. That, I mean, it feels like it's, yeah. just so, it's just not fun to fight all the time. No. And, then, and, I, and, and, I, and I think it's wonderful that till now, and I hope it'll be the same thing, that it just flows like that. But I always have the feeling that... It's a fight. It's oh, a struggle. I mean, and then it gets made, and it's, and it's wonderful, and it's great, and mm. it's also... But it's like... When I read it in 2012, I never thought about that. It was just the story, mm. this love story that I found so intriguing. Mm. I was reading it thinking, oh my God. And, I never, and, I'm, and I'm so not interested in the polemic. I just want to tell the story. I don't, you know, mm. about the polemic, oh, she's young, she's, yeah. you know, but. Thank you. As you know, Ken always brings together a lot of young, aspiring filmmakers. So my next question for you guys is, for, for anyone um, in the audience aspiring to get their own film done, what advice do you offer um, from your own experiences? If you can share a any great advice you have. We're all in this together. <laughs> <clears throat> well, it's a little basic, but I would say that, how to put that? You have to keep an open mind because everybody's going to give you an advice on your movie because they, they need to finance it or they need to... But when you don't really understand what's the problem with what you wrote or like with the story, because like the arguments are not really like, it's exactly what you felt for you, this movie you're talking about. Like you feel that the reasons are more like ideological or political and they're not grounded by something that is talking to you. You're like, because sometimes you have critics that are very good and you're like, yeah, that's true, I must change that. And that's a good idea. And you have to always have this open mind. That's, that's what's cool, I mean. But when you feel that you didn't get the argument, you didn't get it, and, and you're afraid you look stubborn and you're afraid you, you have to stay strong and you have to fight. You have to fight through to keep your character as you wanted because nobody convinced you that you have to change it with the arguments. You're like, no. And so, yeah, you have to keep faith all the time because sometimes you get it and then the movie exists and your character is still there. Yeah. That's what's good to live. Thank you. Mariam, do you have any advice for any aspiring filmmakers? <laughs> and I completely agree with what you said. It's very important because it's true that you, you can be very fragile when you write a, a film because it's like you're, you're, you know, you're revealing something so intimate about yourself. It's something sometimes that is so personal and all of a sudden there's so many people reading it and judging it and giving their opinions about it and they don't necessarily understand what you're trying to say. And you know, Sometimes it's just about detail that you know, makes so much sense to you. So yeah, I think it's extremely important to, be, you know, to, to keep your mind, um, how do you say it, to... to to keep a clear mind about that and to keep a certain distance, to be able to, it's, it's about keeping a balance between what you decide to, to take as, a, as advice from the outside world or as, um, as, as comments or how, and how you decide to experience them, what to, you decide to make, to make of them. And I think it also, for me, I think it has a lot to do also about, about the reason, the motivation between, behind making a film. I think that, you know, a lot of times there's this pressure about, um, so, you know, what is your next film going to be about? You know, have you thought about there? There's always this thing about, especially when you make one film and that, you know, you know, it's, 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 it, you know, um, how do you say it? Like, uh, it, people like it and, you know, that it's received, uh, you know, well. Mm -hmm. People always are expecting and asking you, so what is your next film about? And there is this expectation. And I think it's, what's important is to just keep true to yourself and, um, and to, to, to keep on making films for the right reasons. That's like I was saying before, I, it took me five years between my first short film and my second short film. And it's because I didn't want, I didn't want to make a film for the wrong reason. I really wanted it to be heartfelt. I really wanted to, 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 to feel that I was also uh, defending characters that, that really spoke to me, that, that I felt had um, uh, whose, whose experience I wanted to share. And, and I think it also comes from our own life experience. It's all these things as well that, that we gather, you know, um, sometimes unconsciously. 
and I think it's that. It's just about, about making, I think, films for the right reasons. And I think that when you do that, it is a little bit easier, although it doesn't mean that it's easy. It can be a little bit easier to, to really stick to, to, to your convictions because you have a deep, deep belief. So I think you really have to question your belief when you really invest yourself in writing a film in order to direct it or not. But because I'm, I'm saying it to you as a scriptwriter, of course, <laughs> that's why I say that. But because it's going to be three, four, five years of your life, and it has to make sense. You can't, I know, it's, I think for me, it's the only way. S Celine, any ad any advice you have for aspiring filmmakers? So get a day job. Get and a day uh, job. Oh, that's a good one. Get a day yeah. job. <laughs> and uh, write your story like you would. Uh, don't try to write as like imitating someone else or for um, I don't know. Oh, this would be very tragical. This is what I need to talk about today. Uh, I mean, people need to talk about today. More like if you have to call one of your best friends because something incredibly exciting or funny or weird happened to you today, mm -hmm. the, the way you write should be exactly with the same, you know, engagement. If you are bored when you write or if you are, have the feeling that you're not sincere, then, then you should not do it. But that's my advice. <laughs> same opinion we have. <laughs> Good, yeah. Emily, I mean... Well, yeah, actually... That, I can't wait to hear your advice. Oh, no, no, no. It's actually, it's not, it's not going to be... Uh, um, I hope, actually, it's the same as, as in three. It's hard to know when is it worth, because it takes so long. Mm -hmm. Not always. Sometimes it takes two years, three years. But like for the one that was there, it was 10 years uh, because of different reasons. And even my husband, who's really supportive, said at a, at a moment, just let it go, you know, you're always talking about that. I, I, he said, honestly, I had the feeling you should let this one go, but there was something in me, and I've already let projects go, but something in me where I felt, and it, it's hard as a director, and I, because I co-wrote it also with a, uh, with a co-writer, and for a co-writer, when, if there's no money, there's no money, you know, you get money funding in the beginning, we got it from the CNC, but it's only... 15,000 or whatever in two. Yeah, it's 750 each. Or I forgot how much it was at that. It was so long ago. And then it's really hard to keep the people because at the end of the day, he, after four years, three years of not being paid, he was, uh, I could understand as well. Yeah, that, and I felt bad as well. well. Let's do a new one. Let's do a new one. You know, he had to do his thing. Then I re took it and continued alone. So, I, and then I am so happy I did it. Mm. I'm so happy to be here with the film, to share it here. And I'm, I'm very proud of the film mm. because it's probably the most personal film I've ever done. It has also to do with my mother who passed. And it's, mm. it's very, and that, maybe that's why I had this urge. So I think one shouldn't fight for, anyway, we, you can't. You, you can't fight 10 years for something that you kind of, that you find boring or that you, so that's one thing I would say is just, Believe if it's something that's really there that you have to tell, then just keep it even if it means you, you're never you're not going to be paid and even uh, try to inspire the people with you to keep the faith and, and then after, you know, let them go. And the second thing that uh, really helps me is that I have one friend. Uh, I met her when I did my second short film in 2002 now. It's been 20 years and she did script continuity on my short films, and then on the next, and then on the next. And she and I shared so much. She, she's like my creative partner. She's like my script doctor on every one of my films where she, or even if I get exterior material, and I think it could be interesting, but I'm not sure I have her read it. Now she lives in Singapore. So it's always the, we talk almost every day on all of my scripts. Uh, she, she knows my wavelength so well. And when her critique, the critique is so important because you're alone, you're alone, you're alone. Sometimes with a co-writer, you're so in it. You think it's, this is real. This is great. This is good. And then you, if you have somebody that you trust for so many years, you know that their critique is coming from the good place because a producer, sometimes if you work with him, it's the first time you work with him or the second time, you can't totally trust that what he says or some people say 
Is that true? But when you have somebody like that, that you keep for years, it's just gold worth. Because mm -hmm. when she tells me, ah, you know, this doesn't work, and she has a way of telling it to me that I don't protect, I don't close off. Sometimes you get criticism, you're like this. Mm -hmm. And so I would always say to, to young filmmakers, find yourself that person. person. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Amazing. I, I could sit here and listen to you for another hour or so. It's, uh, I learned so much um, from just listening to you. Thank you so much. We're actually out of time, but I want to uh, give one question to the audience, if I may. Is, is there anyone who has a question to this panel for fascinating women? And I think, you know, I would just like the last question, um, since we are running out of time. So anyone, don't be shy. Oh, Margaret, go ahead. Uh, congratulations. I saw all of your films and I found myself carried away on a different story, one that I don't often get to see. So I was wondering, uh, what was an influence in your life that made you have the courage to follow your vision that you are now giving to all of us? The filmmaker or the film I saw uh, that really, it's, it's 10 short films. It's called The Decalogue from Kislovsky. And at the time I was living in London, I rented it from the Barbican, it was VHS. Mm. And it's so many, so many stories. And it's told, it's so humanly well told. And it's, it so inspired me that I had to do my first feature in Poland. And that's where I met my husband, <laughs> which I'm with like, since 17 years. But the, the, this kind of storytelling from Kislovsky in, um, in um, the Decalogue, so human, so touching, so hard, so beautifully shot, was what made me want to make films, yeah. For me, it's more about literature, actually. I, being, being um, I don't know, more of a person that came, I guess, from journalism, well, I've always had a passion for writing. I used to write a lot. I used to read a lot. I, I love poetry. Uh, my first uh, desire for film was also the desire to be able to explore uh, the interiority of characters as as an author would, uh, I love the I love the fact of being able to 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 be uh, with a character for 20 pages without him or her saying a single word, but just being in his mind, understanding what he's feeling. And for me, it was something that I didn't rationalize. But when I first felt that I wanted to make films, it's true that there was my films are in films where there's a lot of um, a lot of dialogue. Uh, there is very the dialogue is o is always very scarce. And I think that this really come from that. It's just this desire to explore the interiority of characters that comes uh, from literature and I guess also obviously from poetry. Um, so yeah, so. Uh, yes, I'm a bit the same with books. Like when you read a book, you have to imagine everything. So you visualize, so you're not given some art like a movie that is already visual. And so you have your whole imagination that can um, I uh, actually was more a little bit like chosen by cinema than choosing cinema because some people came to me and uh, actually it helped me uh, resolve a big dilemma that I had like for maybe 10 years I didn't really know what I wanted to do and I was um, like doing theater school for like maybe 25, 20 years, 25 years and I didn't want to be an actress because I felt I was as a woman like I was objectified or I didn't feel like doing that. I felt something was missing. And I, at the same time, I was doing some kind of intellectual studies like history, political philosophy, and being with people like, you know, library rats. Like, and I was like, I'm not like that, but I'm not like that either. How am I gonna do? Like, I'm, I'm bored in my theater class, but I'm bored in my university, and I'm, I'm, I feel like a fucking misfit everywhere. And then I found like cinema was, it's not because I'm a big movie fan, it's just that it's perfect to resolve this because uh, I can read books, I can research as you do when you're in university to write a script. And also I can put all the life that I experienced when you act and you have to think about psychology all the time. 
like you have to think about how you leave emotions and situations and so it's a kind of perfect synthesis for me that's what happened thank you so much on 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 behalf of the hollywood foreign press association and the 80th Golden Globe Awards. I want to thank you so much for joining us um, today. It was thank really you. fascinating, and you know, to hear you. And as I said, I could go down for another hour, but unfortunately, we're out of time. So thank you. Thank Have you. a great thank rest you. of the festival, and we hope thank to you. see you soon. Thank you, everyone.